This episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by Trotta, Squarespace, and MailChimp. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. But funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. It's my pleasure to introduce... Jason Calacanis, uh, possibly one of the most inspirational entrepreneurs in the LA area. Um, he's an entrepreneur, an entrepreneurial mentor, a noted angel investor, and he started companies such as Weblogs Inc., Mahalo, This Weekend, and at the Open Angel Forum. So without further ado, Jason. Thanks. Uh, how many? kind of weird to just stand up here. Is it okay if I sit on a chair? Maybe I'll just take a chair. It'll be easier. Um, sort of a mixed crowd. How many people are entrepreneurs in the room? Okay. That's about half. How many people are students? Okay. How many people are lawyers? All right. Get that guy out of here. Uh, that's fine. He's offering free services to any sort uh, of... Of the students, uh, which is really about, about half the crowd, um, uh, how many of you want to be entrepreneurs when you grow up? That's about half. Wow, and the hands, it was very interesting. When I asked how many were students, they went like this. And then when I said, how many want to be entrepreneurs, they went like this. <laughs> that is very appropriate, actually, because um, you should really think long and hard about being an entrepreneur. And I thought the most productive use of time was maybe to talk a little bit about what it means to be an entrepreneur, um, what you can expect, essentially, um, when you go out to be an entrepreneur. Um, I think there's a lot of misinformation about it, and I think it's not for everybody. Um, and it's generally for people at a certain point in life. Um, and so I wrote down some notes uh, of what I've learned being an entrepreneur myself. I, I, the last time I worked for somebody, I was working for Sony Corporation in 1994. Um, and then I started a magazine in 95 and grew that through the dot-com bubble, went from 70 employees down to 20. Uh, and then down to 10, uh, got offered $20 million for that business. It was a, a magazine called Silicon Alley Reporter in New York. Uh, and I can tell you clearly, you learn more on the way down than you do on the way up. Um, my second business was a blogging business called Weblogs Inc. that 18 months after we started it, we sold it to AOL. It did blogs like Engadget, Autoblog, Joystick. Uh, and my third business is uh, called Mahalo, which I'm currently doing. It's an educational site, sort of like the Khan Academy and backed by Sequoia and News Corporation and a bunch of interesting other entrepreneurs. Um, I'm also an angel investor in a bunch of companies, so I get to see a lot of the mistakes. I've made a lot of the mistakes, frankly. Um, I'd say the number one thing uh, that young entrepreneurs have a misconception about is ideas. Um, they actually think that ideas are important and that ideas matter. Um, and the truth is, everybody, 100% of human beings, have ideas unless you're in a coma, I guess. And I bet you people in a coma actually have ideas, too. Um, but ideas on their own mean little. Uh, execution is everything. And in fact, the, the second thing that people have a misconception about is that unique ideas are important. Most of the great companies right now are not unique ideas. Facebook, the greatest, arguably the greatest company, uh, up and coming company in technology, Google would be the greatest company right now in technology, um, <clears throat> was massively derivative. It was a photocopy of Friendster and a cleaned up version of MySpace. Of course, they added a lot of new things to it uh, along the way, but there was nothing amazingly new. Mark Zuckerberg didn't have some massively great idea. He just built a better product and he iterated on it uh, relentlessly. Uh, and, and that's the second point, which is iteration is much, much, much more important than inspiration and ideas. Um, the best companies, Amazon, Jeff Bezos, arguably the best entrepreneur out there today. Uh, people might say uh, Jobs, and they, they'd be right to consider him right next to Bezos. As a matter of fact, most people would say 
Jobs above Bezos, but I would pick Bezos probably above Jobs because he's built companies in three or four different verticals concurrently. He's got the Kindle, so he's sort of like Steve Jobs, and then he's got this e-commerce business, so he's sort of like Walmart, and uh, then he just decided for the hell of it, I'm going to build EC2 and this whole computing platform for common infrastructure that Microsoft and Google and other people couldn't figure out, all concurrently, um, which is... Uh, Interesting because you hear a lot about focus and how important focus is. Focus is another thing that's overrated. Um, pivoting is actually um, underrated. Many, many of the best businesses out there um, did not start um, uh, with a product that makes them famous today. Um, Microsoft would be a great example of one. They were building basic programming language and then DOS and and finally Windows, and then finally Office came along. Um, pure iteration uh, got them to where they are. Um, hard work is uh, the most critical part of being an entrepreneur. Resiliency as well, uh, which and these two things go uh, hand in hand, because being hardworking when you're getting your ass kicked day after day after day, it's hard and it's lonely. Um, how many of the folks uh, who are entrepreneurs here agree with what I'm saying about loneliness and hard? Yes, it's like I'm just seeing these guys nod like, why the fuck did I become an entrepreneur? You're right, it's hard and it's lonely. It is one of the most lonely, uh, isolating things sometimes. My, I, I tell folks when they ask me, like, what do you provide as an angel investor? Um, I say, well, money's not important because money's free today. Um, and that's true and we'll get into that later. Um, money's free to anybody who has a, a good idea uh, and good execution. Um, but uh, my role is really to make a phone call and ask the entrepreneurs every six weeks, how are you doing? And then I listen to the answer and then I say, how are you really doing? Because the answer I get at first is, oh, well, we did this and we got this task and that next task and this task and it's very, you know. But then when I ask it the second time, they say, I'm exhausted. Or, I don't know if this is going to work and we've spent half the money in our bank account. Or, I think I might have pitched you on something that really was a bad idea and we've spent your money and I feel like an idiot. How many people who are entrepreneurs have had these kind of feelings before? Right? You're going to see them and the ones who didn't raise their hand are liars. Uh, or, they haven't experienced yet. Um, Uncertainty, doubt, this is where resilience comes in. Resilience uh, is, I think, the defining characteristic of an entrepreneur. Most folks will uh, hit a roadblock and uh, you know, they'll try to overcome it. Uh, and if they can't, um, they'll decide maybe that roadblock is not worth overcoming. Entrepreneurs have to be very stubborn and very resilient to, to break through. Um, and the difference between, at least in the consumer internet space and the technology space, the difference between that hockey stick curve and you know, the sideways uh, graph is it could be as little as 5 or 10% product iteration. It, it's just one little thing gets corrected and it takes off. And a great example of that is Twitter. Uh, I remember the day uh, Ev and Biz showed me Twitter. We were having brunch and uh, and I had an opportunity to angel invest in it, and I didn't. <sighs> I think that means you should pay attention to none of the advice I give tonight. Um, but there will be some entertaining stories along the way. Um, and it didn't have a website. It was only SMS. It worked the same way as Twitter, but it just worked on SMS. And uh, he said, oh, let me sign you up. Here, I'll give you the handle at Jason, and we'll set you up on Twitter. And I said, okay, what do I do now? And he goes, well, you, you say what you're doing right now. I said, well, I'm having brunch with you. Yeah, and I'm going to say I'm having brunch with you. And it says on my phone, I'm having brunch with Chase at Jason. And I said, why would I care that you're having brunch? You know, like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and he goes, no, no, but it's everybody does it, and it hits scale, and it's going to have this network effect, and da 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 and I said, are you guys high? I mean, <laughs> you basically took the best thing about blogging, the blog post, and you removed it and left the, the subject line. This is the stupidest idea ever. And that is a key point about entrepreneurship, which is, if people understand your idea, by definition, it's probably an idea that's not worth pursuing. 
because it's obvious. When I told people I wanted to create a blogging network in 2003, 2004, and I was going to have 100 blogs, and these people would be amateurs, but they wouldn't be filtered, there'd be no, da, da. They, they just looked at me and said, well, that's stupid. Why would you, what, there's already magazines and there's newspapers. Why would you, what's a blog? I said, oh, it's web logs. It's web, it's, it's, a, it's a log of your life on the web, web logs. You know, and it just, whoosh. And then I said, you know, and they, they couldn't understand it. And that's the good sign. If you have a really good idea, maybe 10, 20, 30 percent of people will, will get it. Another 50, 60 percent will say, "Ah, that's, that's a stupid idea." Uh, and that's what you're looking for, actually, in, in, in an idea. And generally speaking, it's not actually about the idea. It's about spaces and triangulating uh, into spaces, in my experience. So when I discovered the internet in 93, 94, 95, and got the Mosaic browser, and I decided to start this magazine about multimedia, which is what we called it at the time, multimedia. And people would make a mistake and call it multiple media. I'm very interested in your multiple media. Do you have a multiple media CD-ROM with music and pictures and text? Yes, I do. I have your multiple CD-ROM right here. Uh, I knew there was something there, but I didn't know exactly what it was. Same thing with blogs. And then I realized, What's the difference between like, somebody who's actually considered a visionary and the difference between somebody who's considered just a, a normal civilian? And, and the people who are visionary are the people who take some piece of the future and just pretend it already exists and that it's actually going to work. Like, well, of course, you, we're all going to be socially networked and it's going to change the way we do things. And you know, the graph will provide you with all the content and updates you need. You'll never have to ask anybody what they're up to. You'll just know. When I did that with blogs, they just said, oh, well, you know, it's obvious. You know, everybody will have a blog, and everybody will express themselves, and you won't need to read newspapers or magazines for your information. The person quoted in the newspaper article will have their own blog. So if you're interested in what's going on with the earthquake in Japan, you'll just read from a seismologist in a lab somewhere their blog, and it'll be really interesting. Um, that's a great test for your, uh, the beach you're going to surf. Assume that it's going to work. And it's, then once you've decided it's going to work, imagine it's going to grow 10 times, and then imagine it's going to grow 10 times. And then when you talk to people, just uh, explain that vision uh, as if it's already happened, um, and you'll get a good tell. Um, on building teams, um, one thing I've learned really the hard way um, is that you really can't change people all that much. I was a psychology major, so whenever I had team members or employees with problems, I always thought, wow, you know, well, I could just work with them and talk to them about their problem and their issue, and they'll, they'll turn around, and they will. No. If you have any doubt about a member of your team, there is no doubt. You have to get rid of them and replace them. And when you get good people in your company, you need to fire them immediately. Because anybody who is good is taking up a seat for somebody who is excellent or great. Good people should not work at startup companies. Good people should work at big companies. That's what big companies are for. If you want to go work at a big company and you're going to manage thousands of people, it's easier to manage, to, to manage a thousand good people than it is to manage 10 amazing people. A thousand good people will just do what you tell them. I did a good job. Thank you. Here's your gold star. Go back to work. Yes, you know, we're all going to go to the you know, happy hour on Friday. But excellent people just you put a half dozen excellent, amazing people in a room, they will argue and fight and make it uncomfortable. You'll tell them to do something, they won't do it, they'll come back to you. Oh yeah, I know you said to do it that way, boss, but you were wrong, so I did it this way because obviously you don't know what you're talking about. I mean, I have these people in my company and I love them, but I mean, it's infuriating sometimes when I'm like, hey, can you do this? And they're like, yeah, no, we totally understand that that's what you wanted us to do. And we ignored it, you know, like the uncomfortable people uh, the people who are hard to manage, those are the people you want. Those are the people who are going to get shit done. The people who argue and fight um, and, and will stand for a position. Uh, the problem is uh, people create management structures inside startup companies. Uh, and that's the, that's the kiss of death. And when they do that and they try to say, uh, let's just have, let's just, you know, we'll decide on something that everybody can agree on. And that's death. That's not startup companies. That's big companies that produce shitty products. Um, the best companies tend to be like dictatorships with insane generals. You know, like that's a great startup company. It's like you have this great dictator who's like, we're going to conquer, you know, this continent. 
and then there's a bunch of generals who have to like, this guy's taking the beach, that one's taking the mountain, and they fight with each other, and they're, you know, it's just messy and hard. That's what it should be. But people want to, in their minds, have this like, uh, collaboration and the soft, gentle thing. It's not startup. So if you're thinking about starting a company and you want that crunchy granola nonsense, you will fail. I cannot tell you how many startups I've seen with soft founders and they're trying to build, um, what's that terrible word, consensus? God, you think there was any consensus in the iPhone or the iPad? I mean, if they brought the iPad to Steve Jobs and there was some consensus about some feature, he'd throw it at them, you know? He'd smack him in the head with it, like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, this is not right, you know? And, and that's actually true. They came to him first with the iPad and he said this wasn't good enough and they said, but he said, make a phone and then we'll make the iPad in five years. It's a true story. Um, um, investors today um, are very, very, uh, any investors in the audience, any angel investors or VCs? I'll be talking to you later. Um, uh, are very, um, very keen on investing in people who actually build shit. People who are MBAs um, or idea people, they're not getting the funding today. The new model is uh, young folk who, or older folk too, um, but let's face it, entrepreneurship is a young person's game. It's not for old people, generally speaking. Um, it's not for people with families, generally speaking. I know it's politically incorrect, but if you're going to be an entrepreneur, do it in your th 20s and do it in your 30s. And if you have kids and a family, it's, it's gonna be very hard. Trust me, I have a 15, 16 month old daughter and a wife, and it is hard to be a good dad and a family guy and then run a company. I, I would never have been able to run any of the startups I ran previously. And you need to have five times as many resources personally and uh, in your company in order to do it. Um, do it when you're young, uh, not when you get older. But this theme of uh, investing in the developers or the designers, um, it's here to stay. And so I get a lot of people who say, can I show you, can I, can I talk to you about my idea? And I say, no, but when you build something, send me the URL and I'll look at it. And I'm gonna look at every detail of it and depending on how those details are, then I'll determine if we should have another meeting because you've put yourself into the pool of people who wanna talk about ideas. I wanna to talk to the people who've built something and talk about what they built and actually how can we iterate and leverage that and what have you learned from building it? So if you're gonna, uh, take on this entrepreneurial um, uh, activity and, and try to do a startup, you have to have a wedge strategy. I'm gonna build something that just gets my, my little wedge in there and then I can say, hey, by the way, I created this little iPhone app that does this very narrow function for this one campus or I built this website that does X for this small group of people and I have three clients and they love it. Can I ask you for some advice on it? And every time in life that I've asked people with money for advice, they've given me money. And every time I've asked people with money for money, they've given me advice. It is the biggest truism ever. Never ask anybody for money, just say, oh hello, I know that you have a billion dollars. I have this really great idea. Um, I was wondering if I could show it to you because I really respect your opinion and I know that you've done some great things in your life. Talk to the guy with the bow tie. Um, and so uh, can uh, I come see you and maybe just I'll meet you anywhere at any time. Uh, this is like when I was a hustler. Uh, I'll meet you anywhere, anytime for coffee. Uh, if, you, you know, I'll, if you have a commute, I'll take your commute with you, whatever. Uh, I'll meet you for coffee for 15 minutes. I just want to tell you, I want to show you what I built and get your feedback on it. And I, I never get turned down for a meeting when I take that approach. But if you write a long email to a person who's busy or important, they are going to go, oh my God, this email is extremely long and detailed. Delete. Archive. I will get back to it later. The longer the email you write, the less important what you're doing is. One sentence, two sentences, like maximum. And a URL, here's what I'm building. Here's what I've built. That shows people that you are in the bucket of people who build stuff. Uh, and that's how you're gonna get um, uh, people to um, invest in you. And, and generally when people are investing in you, and I said before, money is free. It really is. I mean, money is free right now. Uh, is anybody raising money right now? Anybody here in the audience raising money? You can, it's private. 
Um, I mean, how easy is it? I mean, you're just, just money everywhere, right? Um, no, it's not. Uh, raising money is always hard. It takes time. However, it's never been easier. There are angel investors everywhere. The stock market and the and um, bonds. People are just. They don't. They're not in love with those things anymore. But they're really in love with the idea of building businesses, which is awesome for entrepreneurs. Um, and I have some entrepreneurs who ask me, "Why can't I raise money?" And it's generally falls into um, three buckets. One is. Um, the market that you're going after, the person just does not believe that that market is um, important. The second is your execution is lacking, and that is key. Uh, execution details. Anybody here play poker? Any poker players? Okay. It's just poker. I, like the way, so, if you're a good poker player, like the way somebody announces their bet and the way they hold their chips and their cards and they're leaning forward and leaning back. Are they sweating? Are they drinking from their soda? You know, are they a loud mouth? How many flops have they seen? What's their voluntary VPIP? I mean, there's all these things that you should be studying to understand the context of what they're doing. Well, that's what angel investors are doing, or they should be doing when they're gonna invest in you. Did you show up in flip flops? Or did you answer questions succinctly? Uh, what did your parents do? Were you, you know, uh, do you have a silver spoon in your mouth, et cetera? Um, execution is critical and people overlook it. Um, and then finally, you or your team, um, may just not be that impressive. And uh, that uh, is a hard one to overcome, but the way to overcome it is by having better execution. You could literally have just killed puppies on television, but if you build a great product and, you know, I don't know what it is about our society, but we just love people who can execute. Like, I mean, just look at like pop stars and people do all this crazy stuff, but like, oh, that person is really funny. You know, they tell great jokes or, we're gonna give them a pass. Like, it is the truth. Like, if you execute really well, VCs will give you money. Investors will give you money. It does not matter uh, who you are. It really matters about your your execution. Um, what, uh, in, at least in the consumer internet space, some details which people overlook. Um, the name of a company. This is really stupid, I know, right? Like, oh my God, would you make the decision on investing in a company based upon the domain name? The answer is yes. If you look at the top 100 sites on the internet, uh, none of them are over 10 characters long. They all are easy to spell over the telephone. Uh, and um, they generally have like a nice uh, cadence to them. And you can study these things, but the attention to detail on selecting a domain name, and, and it's hard, right? Like finding a good domain name. Wow, that's a, one of the hardest parts about being an entrepreneur in the internet space. Well, guess what? If you do that well, that means you'll solve other problems. So if you can show up with a domain name like Mahalo, and oh, that means thank you in Hawaiian, and oh, how did you get the domain? You know, like, that's what, oh, you, this new service, color.com, that just came out. They raised $41 million. It's like, oh, color? You, you own the domain name color? Wow. You spent a shitload of money on it. Great, you know. Or, um, these things actually are little tells, just like in poker. Um, the logo design. Anybody can design a gorgeous logo on 99designs now for three, four, five hundred dollars So if you come into a meeting and you say, oh, well, here's my logo and my terrible domain name. It's, you know, um, group-buying-pasadena.lee. What? <laughs> Two dashes and a dot Lee? Oh, Jesus. Like, if you're not gonna get that detail right for our meeting, well, what other details are you not gonna do right? And so people say, oh, like those details don't matter. They do, actually, that's what people are looking for. Um, pivoting, this is critical, uh, and I mentioned it a little bit before. Um, in my first business, I did not pivot, and it cost me a lot of money. I, I had a local publication, email newsletter and conference business about the New York City internet scene. It was the biggest, it made $12 million a year, I had 70 employees, I was the king of New York in the 90s, it was awesome. Like, I would go to the limelight and they knew me at the door and I wrote for Paper Magazine, it was awesome. Um, and then somebody who worked for me who was a little bit older said, you know, we should change the name from Silicon Eye Reporter to just Silicon Reporter or something, just the reporter and let's just cover everything in the internet business. And I said, no, that would be like being disloyal or whatever, we have to like cover New York and that's what we always did. And, Holy cow, was that a huge mistake because I would have had the industry standard before the industry standard it would have become a $50 million in revenue, but I artificially capped it. So I always look back at that. Why didn't I take her advice? You know, it was really good advice. And um, 
I was married to my first idea. I, you know, and you get married to these brands and then, because you think like, that's who I am. Like, oh, I am the, I am the Silicon Alley report. That's me, you know? Um, and I didn't pivot. Um, in the second business, when I did Weblogs Inc., my original idea was business to business newsletters. I thought blogs would be like uh, niche newsletters. Like, oh, there'll be one on nanotechnology, there'll be one on advertising, there'll be one on bonds, there'll be one on this, one on this topic. We'll have one on, uh, and we actually had like wifi.weblogsinc.com. And I met a guy named Peter Rojas, and he said, no, no, you, you gotta have like its own brand, and it's gotta be consumer facing. And we did Engadget, Autoblog, Joystick, and these things came breakaway successes. Um, and that time I said, well, I don't know if that's the case or not, but let's try. The first time I fought it because it wasn't my idea. The second time I said, let's try. Uh, the third time around, when I did Mahalo, we started out with a pretty easy premise. We're gonna do human powered search. And I was able to raise $20 million without a business plan from Sequoia, from News Corp, from Elon Musk, from a bunch of my friends. And it was a really compelling pitch, which was look at these search results. Here's, and I literally gave them a piece of paper. Here's 10 search results. No logo on them. You didn't know if they were Google or Yahoo. And here's another 10 links, and here's another 10 links. I said, which one's the best set of links? And the VC said, this one. And they turned it over and it said Mahalo on the back. And then I turned over this one, it was Google. I turned over this one, it was Delicious. And this one was Wikipedia's links at the bottom of the page. They said, how did you do that? And I said, well, I took these three, and I looked at all the pages, and I put a score on each of the pages, and I took out the ones that were bad, and I added the ones that were not, that were, you know, not listed. Oh, how long did that take? About an hour. Oh, wow, so if you did that for the top 500,000 search terms, you'd have this really interesting human-powered search engine. Yeah, okay, great, let's do it. So we tried, we built it. It had moderate success, which is the worst thing in the world for an entrepreneur, because then you keep doing something. Um, we got to a couple million people, and I said, you know, Google's getting better every year. You know, when we started, Google was just 10 blue links, but look, now they have two videos, some news, Twitter, the stock price. I mean, they're actually making comprehensive search results. Um, the way we designed the pages years ago, or the way Naver in Korea, anybody, any Koreans in the audience? No Naver? Anybody know Hatina? Anybody know Daum? Anybody know, no, okay. Anyway, search technology in Korea and Japan, light speed past what Google was doing back then. Um, and so we looked at what we were doing, and I said, you know, this is not good enough because you, you can't tell the difference. It's not a, a big enough idea. I mean, it's a big idea, but it, it's not changing the world. And we looked at it and said, well, what's working? And somebody said, when we give people an answer, and everybody who tries to, like, take on Google and just winds up crashing into the rocks, it's like the huge siren song of the Internet industry. Like, every great entrepreneur is like, oh, wow, search. And, <laughs> So like I, I got the ship and I'm like, wow, surge. And I'm like, oh my God, this rocks. <laughs> um, and so I said, well, what do you mean? You know, I said, oh, well, you know, like these pages, like how to play guitar and this one over here on how to get expert level in Guitar Hero, these pages are doing really well on Mahalo. They're our top pages. I said, yeah, I know that. And we looked at the pages and we looked at the comments and there was this common theme that when there was a video on the page and we gave people an answer in video, they really liked the page. And I said, oh, wait a second. Why don't we just give people answers in video? Is anybody doing that? Like, no. Well, I was yeah, they are, but they're doing it poorly. So you type in how to play Hotel California on YouTube, you find 50 or 100 people playing it on their webcam. It's no microphone and no guy with the things in his ears and the hipster outfit and everything, good looking guy. Um, <laughs> with the big camera and the rig and everything, the professional sound. And um, why don't we try making some of those videos? So on our guitar page, we put some of like how to play a C chord and how to solve these video, how to solve these video games. And all of a sudden, they start getting hundreds of thousands of views, millions of views. So I said, OK, that's working. Boop, the whole ship, turn around, hire 55 video editors. We're now making eight or 900 videos a week. We're the fifth largest publisher on YouTube. And we're probably going to get to I, in my delusional mind, I think we're gonna hit a million videos to teach you how to do any video game, speak any language, cook any piece of food, uh, play any song on guitar, and solve any math equation. Just basically, the, anybody know the Khan Academy? Have you heard of that? You saw that it's incredible Khan talk, uh, TED this year. Imagine a commercial version of that. Uh, and holy cow, when you, 
when you, when you pivot proactively, that's when you start really becoming a great entrepreneur, I think. I think that that's the secret of some of the, the good people out there, like Evan Williams from Twitter, who went from um, doing podcasting software, Odeo, and was like, this sucks, it's not really working. And the people who are, want this software are like this little group of people that are not growing and they're kind of strange and not that interesting anyway. So um, no offense to podcasters, I'm one of them. And that's where Twitter came from. They just sat around and said, let's iterate. Um, I'm still learning about this whole entrepreneurship thing, so I thought maybe we open it up to some questions and some maybe group chat. I'm interested to hear what you guys think is important advice for entrepreneurs in the room, or potential entrepreneurs, I should say, um, and maybe some questions. Failing. The question is on failing. Why are you looking at me? There's, his question is about failure and that inside of companies. And I guess, how do you make a company okay with failure? So leadership is uh, largely by example and by repeating yourself over and over and over again. Um, that is true leadership, is repeating the core mission. We make videos that will teach people how to do anything. I, mean, I say this five times a day. Are we teaching people? Did you learn something from the video? Um, and when we have our leadership meetings every Monday at Mahalo, um, when, we're looking at, when we're looking at an issue, we'll just say, if there's something that's failed, um, let's figure out how to fail fast. These, video, these type of videos aren't working, or this approach to answering questions isn't working. Let's find that out as quick as possible so that we can try something else. So if you um, fail quickly, what that does is it lets you cross something off your list. OK, we want to get to the new world. We're leaving from Spain. Let's make a left. Oh, wait, there's no new world there. Fine. Oh, let's go straight. Actually, they weren't looking for the new world. There was an accident, so it's a bad example. Um, but if they were, that would be a good way to go through it. We know it's not that way. We know it's not that way. Let's try that way. Um, and so when you put it in the context of um, let's try, and a lot of times I'll tell people when we're deciding on something, because that's where um, the leadership is. OK, we can go X, or we can, go, we can do X, or we can do Y, uh, or we can do Z. I like to frame it at that point. OK, does anybody feel strongly about these ways? Let's argue it. And then I'll say, OK, now flip your positions. You argue that person's position. You argue uh, the other person's position. They'll argue each other's positions. Um, and then I'll say, is, this, is there a clear winner here, or should we uh, flip a coin? Because this feels like a coin toss decision to me. And let's just make a decision right now. And let's do it for two weeks. And then look at the metrics. And when you create that culture, just like nobody's responsible for it. We're just eliminating options. We're testing things. Then you've moved from like this blame game and this political stuff at organizations where people have fiefdoms to a more holistic, like, um, oh my god, did I use the word holistic? Uh, a more assassin-like, <laughs> deft, murderous, samurai-like destruction, where you can just eliminate and destroy things on your way to conquest. But it's a good question. Uh, and in, as far as entrepreneurs go outside it, you didn't ask this question, but man, I mean, we live in the great, it, as screwed up as things are in this country sometimes, and man, this is a wacky country with some of the stuff going on. I mean, people making science into um, something stupid and taking out evolution from textbooks. I mean, I'm worried for this country. I mean, I'm not worried about this part of the country. I'm worried about the part like in the middle uh, and the south. But um, man, those people are dumb. Really? Like, you take, I'm not talking about all the people there. I'm talking about the people who want to take evolution out of textbooks. And Really? Wow. Um, but failure uh, in this country is, uh, the precursor to success. This is why I don't understand anybody who's a criminal. These people who are stealing, it's like, the system is set up in a criminal fashion already. You can start a company, fail. The next day, you go to another investor, and you're like, hey, by the way, I failed. They go, oh, what did you learn? Oh, really? Cool, what are you going to do next? Let's talk about what you're going to do next. It's like, oh, really? Well, I failed at two things before that, too. Oh, awesome. What were, what were the learnings there? You know, like, if you're in France, you know, and you're like, oh, my business failed. They're like, oh, you failed? You need to pay all these people for two years. Entrepreneur. <laughs> I mean, they hate entrepreneurs. Ridiculous. Um, you are, oh, what? This person is good and you want to fire them? You need to go to court. 
Give them a warning and a period to correct. Co correct being average? How do you, I mean, you're an average person. You're not going to be corrected. Um, so really, that's an, it's a big part of entrepreneurship is not overestimating the downside risk. The downside risk is start again. Now, this is where I got back to that thing about like the whole families and responsibility. Like, if you have three kids, do not take this piece of advice. This is like the fine print. If you have three kids and they are in college and they have to go to private school, do not take all your money and put it on black. And, and, <laughs> you may want to put some on the, the double zero as well. Um, no, seriously, like gambling when you have responsibility is not a smart idea. Gambling when you don't have responsibility like me, that's an awesome idea. Uh, you know, gambling is fun. Um, anyway, what was another question? Yeah, so the question uh, was um, for the audience at home. Um, mentorship, how do young people find mentors? Um, I always just asked, and I wasn't afraid to ask people for help and ask them for advice. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, ask for advice. And so when I was doing my magazine, I uh, asked somebody who I knew, knew Graydon Carter, if they could get a meeting with me so I could talk to him about the cover of the magazine. Like Graydon Carter of Vanity Fair, you know? And um, one time when I was at a Knicks game, I had like the second issue of my magazine, and there was this guy in the front row at the Knicks game named uh, John Kennedy Jr., and he had just launched a magazine called George. So I basically waited for the timeout, and I walked straight fast down to the front row, knowing that security was about to tackle me, uh, and I put my magazine right in John F. Kennedy Jr.'s hands, and I looked him in the eye and said, I'm a publisher just like you. My magazine's about the internet. It's going to change everything. And then I felt the arm on my shoulder. It was a security guard. And the guy, uh, and, and John Kennedy just said, no, it's OK. It's, it's OK. It's OK. I want to talk to him. And he said, oh, yeah, what is the internet exactly? I've been hearing about all this stuff. And I'm like, well, it's going like, to connect everything. It's sort of like the information superhighway. So you could deliver your magazine through. And he's like, that's really interesting. We should talk about that at some point. You know? And I was like, yeah, we should talk. And they get dragged away by security. Like, you have to go seek them out and ask them. Um, the problem with Generation Y, and I, I'm, gen, I'm Generation X, and we had our own unique issues and problems, um, but the issue with Generation Y folks is um, they didn't have this like competition gene instilled in them. They didn't have to fight, and they were told that like fighting and winning and all this shit was not important, it, like is the most important thing in life, like fighting and winning and competition, like yeah, that's what life's all about. Like why did they tell you this? Huge mistake. Did any of you get participation trophies? Seriously, tell me the truth if you got a participation trophy. No, is this just all made up? Did they have winners in games? Did they have actually a winner in the soccer game or no? Did they keep score? I keep hearing from these people there was no scores. Um, <laughs> How could there be no score? Of course there's a score. Um, so I find that a lot of this, you didn't ask me this question, I'm just gonna pretend you did. Um, it doesn't feel like answering it. Um, a lot of these Gen Y uh, kids, like maybe half of them, they don't want to win and they feel guilty if they were to succeed and make a lot of money. And if they had a private jet, they would think that was bad and they would rather bicycle across China and do a cause-based marketing, I don't know what the fuck they're talking about, <laughs> cause-based career. Don't you want to make money? Don't you want to win? Don't you want to have a house and a car? And what, You want to have some big meaning in your life? Like winning is meaning. Go make a lot of money and then give it away. You know who's going to change the world? Bill Gates. And he's going to change it twice. Once on the way up when he made all that money and then on the way down before he dies, curing every fucking disease on the planet. That's winning. I'm going to ride a bicycle through China and try to get sponsorship. You know, like, I had this guy in a meeting with me. And they had an interview. He tried to explain to me how, you know, I was like, so is this really what you want to do? And he's like, no. And I was like, no? You, well, what would you like to do? Because at this point, I'm just amusing myself that somebody would actually be in a job interview with the CEO of a startup company who is known as being an absolute fucking maniac and tell them that they're not interested in being part of their mission. Like, I'm like, what? What would you rather be doing? He said, oh, I want to take a bicycle across China and get like logos from companies and show you know, the regional workers and how that's changing. Said, that's not going to change their plight. It's going to do nothing. You're just going to ride a bicycle. You're going to get like calluses. I mean, you're going to be, you're not going to change anything. Like, 
you want to change something like build a product that changes the world and go over there and you know yeah open a factory and give people equity in the company and make them rich you know or, or give them a better life but like riding a bicycle across country this could do anything Delu are you delusional anyway next question <laughs> sure uh, that's a great great uh, question uh, inventors and entrepreneurs um, tinkerers and people who tr build teams that um, go and take tinkering and change the world. Uh, if you're one of those people who likes to build cool things but doesn't like to maybe deploy them out in the real world, you need to get a co-founder who does. And maybe she would like to be out there, you know, raising the money and uh, doing the, the press conferences and the press tour with your amazing product while you stay at home and, you know, tinker and invent stuff. Uh, and that's totally valid. Uh, you know, and, and there's been a, there's been great collaborations. I mean, you had Paul Allen, and um, you know, who was get, doesn't get enough credit for the software innovations that he had at Microsoft, and you had Wozniak, who you know basically was the whole show in the beginning. I mean, Steve wasn't capable of any technical stuff. It was all Woz in the beginning. That's changed, obviously. So yeah, I mean, that's that's where co-founders come in real handy. Um, and you just you know, those dorky, obnoxious. MBA people at the parties that you guys go to, whatever, like the MBA school people, get one of those people. Like, they, the MBA guys are all looking for technical co-founders. How do we get a technical co-founder to do work that I can take credit for? I, I, need, I need some technical co-founders, but that's like the big thing in the, you know, like the angel scene. I get all these people who are like, listen, I have an incredible idea. Can you get two people to do the work so I can take credit and most of the equity? I'm like, no, but that sounds like a great deal. Can I get it? <laughs> really? Wow. Well, what do they need you for? Well, I'm going to lead the company. Well, what? They, I mean, that's the whole Y Combinator phenomenon. It's like, you need a leader? You need a, you know, not really. I mean, anyway. Another question? Uh, team building. Yes. Team building is uh, probably the most important part about building a successful startup company. Um, I mean, picking an incredible market is also really important. People overlook that. So a great team in a terrible market, like we could have the smartest guys in the world, and if Steve Jobs and his team made a new fax machine, it would still suck. You know, like there's just no amount of awesomeness you can put into a fax machine to make it good. Um, so market, very important, uh, but team is, is right up there. Um, I find that you have to get to know people, uh, you know, who they are at their core and what motivates them. and define a culture, and this is gonna get like really granola um, and, and happy kumbaya, but, and I used to make fun of this stuff when I was a younger entrepreneur, but now I've actually learned a little bit about it. And this culture thing is real. Um, culture is a fancy word for just what do you, what kind of place do you wanna work at every day? And so when you define the culture of what you want to do every day, and this is the, one of the great, great parts about being an entrepreneur is that you create your own world. It's like, oh, I want in my world everybody to be hardworking and put in 60 hours a week. Guess what? That's my company. If you don't work, I mean, he works there. I mean, am I lying? Am I a terror? Yes. But do you like working there? Have you learned a lot? Have you done more at this job than any other job before? Okay, right. So, I mean, I can ask that question to almost everybody. He knows how to answer the questions. <laughs> um, no, but I can ask that question to almost all of them, and they'll all say the same thing uniformly, which is like, yeah, but this is like, everybody's hardworking here, and everybody puts in a lot of time, and everybody wants to succeed. But when I didn't have that defined in the early days, I had people who were upset, like, oh my God, why are we working so much? And are we getting paid overtime? You know, what, uh, how come, uh, and you're just like, wait a second, you're at a startup company, you own equity in the company, you're, you're not supposed to be looking at the clock, you're supposed to be looking at the product and saying, how do I make that awesome? What are you going to do? Go home and watch Mad Men or something stupid? I don't know. It's probably a good show, but I mean, what what else? Are you, so anyway, if you define that culture, and those first two or three people who join it, uh, you spend some time with them discussing that. Like, what do we want to? What kind of people do we want here? And is this person like us? And it doesn't have to be that everybody's exactly like you, but there are some core tenets, some principles that you should share. And in our company. It's hard work, resiliency, resourcefulness. Like we like clever people. Um, like so, if you scored really well on your standardized test, like good for you. But I want the person who knows how to get into the movies for free, you know, like or how to scam some shit and you know get to the back door. Like I want those people. I want hustlers, you know. Like and so, once you define that, 
the team members then gravitate to each other. And then your job as the founder is to just see if you can strengthen your relationship with those people. And it gets harder and harder as the company gets bigger. I, my specialty is in companies that are under 50 people. We have 100 right now. Uh, and to be frank, it's hard. Like, we don't really know each other that well. This is the first time we've hung out outside the office. And, um, but I need to get to know him at some point. It's just, it's really hard for me to be an inspirational leader to him if we haven't really gotten to spend time together. So I try to have other people in the team do that, take them to lunch, hang out with them, know where they grew up, you know, all these kind of like small things that um, don't seem important really are. Um, so I, I, I have this crazy theory that there's a correlation between the number of meals and the number of times you get drunk with your team and the success of the team ultimately. And so I just had a keg, we had a keg. You had the keg party on Friday? You weren't there? Oh, it's awesome. It's rolling rock. It's awesome. Anyway, we had a keg. I was just like on, last week, I was just like, you know what? It feels like everybody's like in a little bit of doldrums. I was like, just get a keg and some peanuts and chicken wings and let's put tables in the back of the parking lot and hang out. And people just hung out all night drinking and it was awesome. That's leadership. And, you know, this guy's like, I want to work for that guy. <laughs> that dude thinks that drinking beer is leadership. No, it is. That's the hard work of being a leader. Um, but it is. And sitting there and actually saying to the person, like, hey, how are you doing? How's, how's life? You know, and how's your wife or your kid or, you know, how's your sick mom? You know, like, that's, that's the truth about leadership. It's just, it's really like human, like real, real shit. Let's turn into Oprah. Uh, <laughs> is this your perfect life? Another question in the back? What would I do differently? Oh, geez. Uh, how much time do we have? That food's going to get cold. Um, things I would do differently. Um, I didn't listen for the first half of my career to anybody about anything and was extremely successful, which gave me this um, cause, core, cause causation problem in my mind that I knew better than everybody. And the truth was I knew better than most people, but not all. And that's the problem with smart entrepreneurs and successful people. Like, they are the smartest person in the room sometimes. You know, like I know Larry Page. I've met him on a bunch of occasions. Like, if he walks into the room, yeah, he, people, if he walked in right now, I, I'm going to say he's probably the smartest person. No offense to anybody else here, but that motherfucker is smart. Like, there are smart people in the world, and they are successful, right? Um, so then the problem becomes, like, you, you're not smart about everything all the time. And that's where this success problem happens. So I think I didn't listen enough, and I didn't take anything to heart. And then there was a period of time when I realized that, and then I listened too much, <laughs> and I started to be like, well, oh, really, what do you think? And, and then I was like, really like letting people, you know, express themselves, and that was all good, venting, but I didn't, um, I forgot like, you know, hey, wait, you're the captain of the ship, and like, we can talk about what direction we're going, but we're going in a direction. And if there's a debate about what direction we're going, it's my ship. I'm going to pick at the end of the day. I'm going to take everybody's input. But there's going to come a point when the ship has to go because there's only a certain number of lemons and you're going to get scurvy and we're all going to lose our teeth and <laughs> it's going to get fucking crazy and people are going to lose their minds. Like, we need to keep the ship moving. And you can get your own ship. And then that's when you get that balance. And, so, and then also not selling my first company for $20 million when I owned 86% of it. That was a big mistake. I would have, I would have sold that one. Um, yeah, but, you know... When you get to a certain point, I'm 40 years old right now, and like, holy cow, my life is so fucking awesome. I just like, I wake up every day and I can't believe it. Like, I get to do whatever I want, and it's such a great country, and I've got my daughter, and she's talking. And it's just like, life is so good. Like, I, all of the mistakes and all of the hustle and problems and, mis you know, fights I've gotten into and all the stupid things I've done, it's like, it's just all the character that like makes up the fabric of who you are. So like no regrets, like you, all those scars, I love them. I mean, part of what I hate now is like, it's so easy, like I can, and this is where like you start to lose your edge as an entrepreneur. In the beginning, nobody invited me to any parties. I never got any speaking gigs. 
I was an outsider. I could, I, you know, not only could I not speak at an event like this, I couldn't get in. You know, I, that was the truth. You know, and then you become an insider, and now it's like I can raise money anytime I want. I get to meet all these people. Like, and all of a sudden you you lose your hard edge, and that's a real transition when you have to fight for every inch, and then like it gets easy. You just you have to change your motivation. It's like competition is a very good motivator when you're young, you know, and like Michael Jordan was just like this awesomely competitive person who just wanted to win at everything and um, he was able to keep up that competitive spirit even though it was in something that would be seemingly meaningless like putting a ball in a basket. And that's actually the challenge as an entrepreneur when you get to like company number two or three or four and you got this cush life and you know, what gets you out of bed in the morning to win? You have to have some love for the game. You have to have some love for the process, for the mistakes, for the firings, for the hirings, for the triumphs. I mean, it's what's really glorious about entrepreneurship. And so I said in the beginning, it's not for everybody. And that is true. But for the people who do it, and they do it with all their heart, and they don't stop, and when they get their ass kicked, and they get hit by the ball, and it sucks, they just persevere, they persevere. And they'll hit it because it's inevitable. Like if you just keep swinging the bat, do two or three of these companies, so something's gonna hit, you're gonna learn. But you have to do it in your 20s. It's not gonna happen in your 30s or 40s. And if you're one of those older students in your 30s or 40s, it might happen. But um, <laughs> you should have done it in your 20s. I don't mean to bum you out. But uh, no, there, it can happen for older entrepreneurs. But if you're 20, like, it is much better to do it in your 20s. Do it now, there is no downside risk. Like I don't wanna tell you Go do it, but go fucking do it. Take a chance because this, the, that big company is always gonna have a job offer for you. Man, get like five people together and just build something and see if you can change the world and you know, be an owner in something. You know, like, that's what it's about. Owning something and changing the world. And then yeah, yeah, you can sell it to somebody and be part of something bigger. There's nothing wrong with that. But man, you, gotta, you miss 100% of shots you don't take. And you know, I have friends who, just talk about all the things they didn't do and they had the Facebook idea before MySpace had it and they had the Groupon idea before Groupon had it. All these people had these ideas before anybody did it and you know, I'm just like, well, if you're, you know, they say like, you know, like, these people say like, I have a million dollar idea, you know, and it's like, are you kidding me? Like, I, it, I'm not even like into, I have like 17 ideas before I even make my coffee in the morning that could be million dollar ideas. Like, this, ideas are everywhere. It's, there's nothing to that. It's only the execution that matters. So that's it. That's the difference, is that first step, that just letting the ball leave your hands. And that's the thing that most people are terrified of doing and they will not do. They'll pick up the ball, they'll look at it, but they won't get in the game, they won't let it leave their hands. That's it's just that one moment of intent, of just taking your shot. So anyway, should probably wrap up. <laughs>